All right, good morning, Church on the Square. Grace and peace to all of you this morning. Our text is going to be 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 through 14. If you have your Bible with you, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, and I'm going to begin by reading the text. After this, the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanan, his son, reigned in his place. And David said, I will deal loyally with Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father dealt loyally with me. So David sent by his servants to console him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the Ammonites. But the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanan, their lord, do you think because David has sent comforters to you, to you that he is honoring your father? Has not David sent his servants to you to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved off half their beard and cut off their garments in the middle at the hips and sent them away. When he was told to David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, remain at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. When the Ammonites saw that they had become a stench to David, the Ammonites sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rohab and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 foot soldiers, and the king of Makkah with 1,000 men, and the men of Tob, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the Ammonites came out and drew up in battle away at the entrance of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah and of Rohab and the men of Tob and Makkah were by themselves in the open country. When, Job, when Joab excuse me, saw that the battle was set against him, both in front and in the rear, he chose some of the best men of Israel and arrayed them against the Syrians. The rest of his men he put in the charge of Abishai, his brother, and he arrayed them against the Ammonites. And he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you will help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the Ammonites saw that the Syrians fled, they likewise fled before Abishai and entered the city. Then Joab returned from fighting against the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. The subject of this morning's lesson is risk and the cause of Christ. And by risk, I mean quite simply, any action that exposes someone to the possibility of loss or injury. In other words, if you take a risk, you might lose money, you might lose your reputation, you even might lose your life. And what's worse about it is that by engaging in risk, you might endanger not just yourself, but others. You may lose their money or harm their reputation. Their life might be at stake. And so given such natural consequences, the question arises as to whether a wise and loving person should ever take risks. For is it ever prudent to expose yourself to loss? Is it ever loving to endanger someone else? Could it not be argued, in other words, that in every case, risk-taking is both a foolish and inconsiderate choice. Now before such pressing questions can be answered, we must first address a more fundamental one, namely why there is such a thing as risk in the first place. Put simply, the reason there is such a thing as risk is because there is such a thing as ignorance. If there were no ignorance, in other words, there would be no risk. Risk exists because the future is unknown to us. And what this means, then, is that God himself is not a risk taker. Being omniscient, which is to say all-knowing, God already knows the outcomes of every one of his choices before he even takes them. And since he knows the outcome, he plans accordingly. Now, there is a version, an understanding of God's omniscience that's growing in popularity as of late, something called open theism, which says that God can't know the future for certain because the future can't be known for certain. That while God can predict with great probability what's going to happen, he can't know for sure, and so God has to take risks. 
fact, one of the first seminal works of this particular understanding, the title of it is The God Who Risks. But I don't find the open theist arguments to be persuasive. I think there's way too many passages in scripture that speak about God knowing the end before the beginning, as scripture says, or even knows my very thoughts before I have them. So if we understand God's omniscience to be perfect in that sense, to know the future perfectly, then that means that there's no possibility that God ever takes risks. But this, of course, is not true for us. Our knowledge is finite. We don't know what will happen in the future. And God does not tell us what he intends to do today, much less in five years from now. And this is apparently how God wants it. Other than providing us a highly figurative sketch of the ending of this present age, as well as a set of general principles to follow, which tend to produce certain outcomes. Other than that, it seems that God has purpose for us to live and to act, for the most part, in ignorance and uncertainty about the outcomes of our actions. He says to us, for example, in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and get gain, whereas you do not know about tomorrow. What is your life? For it is a mist that appears for a moment and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. The truth is, we have no idea if our heart is even going to continue to beat for the remainder of this service. Just as we don't know if some oncoming vehicle will swerve out of its lane and hit us as we are heading home this afternoon. We don't know if the food at the restaurant where we will eat has a deadly virus in it. We don't know if a stroke may paralyze us before the week is out and on and on we could go. Ignorance and uncertainty about tomorrow is the native air that we breathe. A truth that recent global events have brought home to many in our world. However, rightfully that is so. So all of our detailed plans for future activities can be shattered by a thousand unknowns whether we stay at home and hide under the covers, or we ride a motorcycle down the freeway without a helmet on, whether we wear an N95 mask or we don't. And therefore, risk is built right into the very fabric of our finite lives. We couldn't avoid it even if we wanted to. And so the question is not whether you're going to take risks, but to what end are you taking them? And thus my burden this morning is to demythologize a prevalent myth in our society, and by myth here I mean a false belief, concerning safety, to stir us from the enchantment of security that modernity has lulled us into. Because the tragedy is that this deception, where we are blinded to the risks that we take every day for ourselves, can, pre can prevent us from taking risks for the cause of Christ because we are deluded into thinking that such noble risks might jeopardize a security that in fact does not exist. One whose flimsy facade could be torn down in a tragic instant. One of the things that the pandemic has done for us is that it's revealed the prevalence of this myth of security by exposing how hidden the risks are that we commonly take. For when presented with a new risk, the pandemic, one that hasn't yet been hidden, our extreme reaction to it reveals that we become blind to all the activities that we commonly engage in, which are much riskier. A young man, for example, skips church so that he won't catch the life-threatening coronavirus, but drives on the interstate every day to pick up takeout from his favorite bistro, probably wearing an N95 mask as he drives alone in his car. All of which is absurd, of course, because his chances of dying in a car accident are much higher than his dying from COVID. But he has become blind to the risks that he takes every day on the highway. And the new risk threatens the false sense of security that such blindness provides him. Now, eventually, COVID will be absorbed into this myth and the false feeling of safety will return. I think we're already headed in that direction. But the answer to this kind of catastrophizing, because there will be another crisis that emerges that throws us back into that state, the answer to such catastrophizing is not to dismiss these threats entirely, but to allow them to awaken us to the fragility of life. The reality that this world is full of risk, 
and that therefore we must consider each risk we take carefully, giving preference to those which have noble ends, those which have a greater reward. The problem with the church today, the reason it is so weak in the face of these trials, is that due to the myth of safety, we have chosen our risks poorly. We've engaged in poor risk management, we might say. Now the way I hope to disenchant us from the charm of this myth of security is to go to scripture and demonstrate that it's right to risk for the cause of Christ. That God, in fact, is calling us to take such risks for the advancement of his kingdom, regardless of what it costs us. Now, my comments are generally inspired by something I read a number of years ago, a book, the title of which is Risk is Right. And I recommend that book to you, at least parts of it. It's written by John Piper. And it's really formed my thinking on this subject to a certain extent, although the conclusions, I think, as you will see, I draw the conclusions I draw on my own, and I, and I don't know that Pastor Piper would follow me on the conclusions. But we begin our study in 2 Samuel 10, the text that I read at the beginning. And where we're headed is verse 12, this great, famous text. But the background of this is that the Ammonites, as we read, have shamed the messengers of Israel and made themselves therefore odious in the sight of David, who is the king of the Israelites. And so in order to protect themselves from David, they hire the Syrians to fight with them against the Israelites. Joab, who's the commander of David's forces, finds himself surrounded with Ammonites on one side and Syrians on the other. So strategically speaking, this is the worst possible position that he could be in. So he divides his troops, putting his brother Abishai in charge of one group, and he takes the other. In verse 11, they pledge themselves to one another. <coughs> And then comes the great verse, verse 12, which says this, Be of good courage. This is Joab speaking to his brother. Be of good courage, and let us play the man for our people, for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. Now that last phrase is a bit peculiar. What is it exactly that Joab means when he says, May the Lord do what seems good to him? Well, it means that Joab had made a daring decision to stay and to fight rather than to run away, to face these insurmountable odds in order to protect the cities and the people of God, as it says. And he did all of that without knowing how it was going to turn out. In other words, he had no special revelation from God on the matter. It's not like God spoke to him and said, if you stay and fight, I will deliver these people into your hands. He has no such message as far as we know. And yet, he chose to risk it anyway. And he handed the results over to the Almighty. And this was right, right? This wasn't foolish, it wasn't selfish or unloving, but it was right. The reason is recorded here in this text is to commend Joab's choice. To communicate clearly that even when the odds are stacked against you, that even when you are surrounded by invading armies, that even when the consequences of such a risk are dramatic. Joab's decision could have led to the slaughter of all of his men, not just consequences for himself, but all those whom he led. And even when God has given you no clear indication <clears throat> as to what, to the end, that what the end result would be, even in that situation, it is right to risk for the cause of Christ. <clears throat> which is to say that a level of risk which would be irresponsible and foolish to take for ourselves is wise and prudent to risk for God's kingdom. The criterion that we use to judge risk for personal gain, in other words, should not be the same criterion we use to judge risk for godly gain. And the conflating of those two has prevented much kingdom advancement in recent years. We've looked at a risk as the church of the living God. We've looked at a risk and said, ah, geez, I don't know. It doesn't really seem to, to weigh out right. The risks, you know, the risk reward, I guess we have a low vision of the reward, but we're often taking the same criteria we'd use personally for personal gain and say, well, it's just too risky. Why should, why should I risk it? And we're applying that to the tasks that we are commanded to do concerning things for godly gain. And so we say things like, well, you know, I don't know, if we speak out against this, we might lose our lease, right? 
or if we speak out against this strongly, we may le lose our biggest contributors, or we speak out against this, and our reputation in the community will be tarnished. There was an evangelist uh, in 2018. His name was John Allen Chow. And if you don't know his name, you should, because this man was one of the heroes of faith. This is right, this is Hebrews 11 kind of, kind of hero. Okay. In 2018, Brother Chow decided that he was going to take the gospel to a particular people on Sentinel Island. These people were not just unreached, they were uncontacted. They had been untouched, in other words, by the modern world. So these people were completely lost. And he decided after a lot of preparation and, and work to try to be able to speak their language and communicate with them and understand the culture as best they could, he decided that he was going to go and make contact with these people. A significant risk, right? And he went, I think the first time it went okay, but the second time he made contact, they killed him. And what rose up out of that event as soon as it made national media was so many evangelical leaders saying that that was a massive mistake, that was foolish. They, some even accused him of being selfish, right? And ridiculous, foolhardy, like he was seeking his own glory. That's the only kind of person that would do something crazy like that. That we have ways now, modern methods of evangelism in which we can go about evangelizing lost people and no one ever will get hurt, in which it will be safe. Now notice those modern methods hadn't reached the people on Sentinel Island yet. And when you look into them, they take 10, 15, 20, 30 years to accomplish. The old way of doing it was the way that Brother Chow did it, which is you study as much as you can and you go and you die. And then someone comes behind you and they die and then someone comes behind them and they die and eventually by the third or the fourth or the fifth person, they begin to trust these outsiders and then eventually they learn their language and proclaim the gospel to them. That's how the, the scriptures, how the gospel's been spread throughout Africa in the beginning when we first went. But this is viewed as irresponsible, right? It's foolish, foolhardy. Now notice the immediate results of Joab's risk-taking. Right? He takes the significant risk, and the results are dramatic. When his armies demonstrate their resilience, first the Syrians run away, and then when the Ammonites see their retreat, they follow suit. And isn't this just how it is in our current environment? The woke mob surrounds its prey, threatening destruction. But if they meet resolve, they scatter like cowards. And we should not also, by the way, be intimidated into thinking that even though God is on our side, that somehow the odds are stacked against us. Because as Paul said, for if God is for you, then who can be against you? And if we begin to doubt this truth, we should remember the words of Jehoshaphat, who said this in Second Chronicles, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. This is a message we find throughout the Old Testament in particular. Jehoshaphat is asking the question, who can thwart the will of God? And the answer is no one can, no one. The most decorated officer in the history of the Marines was this guy named Chesty Puller. And it was reported that he, had, he boasted once to a subordinate when his unit got cut off and he was utterly surrounded by the enemy. He said to him, those poor souls, they've got us right where we want them. For now we can shoot in every direction. <laughs> that kind of confidence is completely legitimate when it comes to the generals of the Lord's army. It's not a misplaced confidence there. For if the Lord is with us, who can be against us, Paul asked. Right, so they've kicked us out of our building, right, and we are meeting on the lawn of the courthouse in the blistering Texas sun. And what I want to say is that they've got us right where we want them. Right? <laughs> this is exactly where we want to be. Let's consider a few more examples from Scripture of this noble kind of risk-taking. And you will know these. Uh, passages of scripture because these are the heroes of faith. These are the ones that the Bible commends to us saying be like these people. The next one comes from the book of Esther in chapter 4. You may recall from this story that there was a Jewish man named Mordecai who had been carried away into Babylonian captivity. And he had a younger cousin named Esther 
whom he adopted as a daughter when she was orphaned. And Esther grew up to become a beautiful woman and was eventually taken by King Ahasuerus to be his queen. Meanwhile, Haman, who was one of the king's chief princes, hated Mordecai, and he hated all of the Jewish ref refugees. And so he persuaded the king to decree that they all be exterminated. But there is a twist, of course, to the story, because there's always a twist in a good story, and that is that the king didn't realize that his own queen was a Jew. Now, the main character arc of the story is Esther's, the queen, which climaxes in the following dilemma. On the one hand, Esther knew that anyone, even the queen, who approaches the king without being summoned will be put to death unless the king shows them mercy by extending his golden scepter. This was the law of the land. Everyone knew it. Yet she also knew that if no one intervened, that her people would be slaughtered. Mordecai exhorts Esther to take the risk and approach the king on behalf of her people and the cause of God. And we get her answer in verses 15 and 16. Then Esther told, that, told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Now what does Esther mean by this, if I perish, I perish? Well, she didn't know what the outcome of her actions would be. She had no divine revelation as to what would happen. It was completely unknown to her. And yet, she decided to do it anyway, to risk it all anyway. And this was right. It is right to risk for the cause of God. Another example we can turn to in the Old Testament comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Again, a familiar story to you. We are again in Babylon during the captivity. The present king is Nebuchadnezzar. And he sets up a golden image and he commands everyone to bow down before the image when the trumpet sounds. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Jews, refused to bow down because they worship the one true and living God who forbade the worship of idols. So in verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar threatens them and says that if you do not bow down, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. And in verses 16 through 18, he's given an answer. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. This, of course, is sheer risk. We believe that God is going to deliver us. They have that kind of confidence, but they don't know for sure. Even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to you. So these three men are in the dark as to how things are going to turn out for them, at least in the immediate future. They know how it's going to turn out for them ultimately, and that's what gives them such confidence. But in the immediate future, they don't know what's going to happen. They say virtually the same thing that Esther says. If we perish, then we perish. And they handed the outcome over to God in the same way that Joab and Abishai did. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. And this was right. It was right to risk for the cause of God. Finally, we consider the great New Testament risk taker, the Apostle Paul. In Acts 21, Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. He has resolved in the spirit to go there because he had collected funds for the needy saints and he was checking to see if they had been delivered faithfully. And he gets as far as Caesarea, and it says in the text that a prophet named Agabus bound his own hands. He sort of acts out a prophecy. He takes Paul's belt, and he bound, binds his own hands, and then he speaks these words. Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this girdle and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when the other believers heard this, they started to freak out and they begged Paul not to go on his journey. But here is the res response in verse 13. What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, Paul believes that this trip to Jerusalem is necessary for the cause of Christ. And yet, what he knew for certain was that imprisonment and affliction awaited him. And yet he decided to do it anyway. 
In fact, this was the pattern of Paul's entire life. His whole Christian ministry was one extraordinary risk after another. Now, most of the time, he didn't know what the outcome of his, of his actions would be, but they often included great suffering, a sampling of which we read about in 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 24. He says, five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been adrift at sea. <clears throat> On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. So what does all of that mean? Well, it means that not only did Paul not know what was going to happen to him when he took these risks, but that the immediate consequences of them were often very terrible. And yet, he didn't stop taking the risks. He continued to take them anyway. And people around him thought he was mad, his fellow Christians. Many of them thought he was out of his mind. 2 Corinthians 6.10, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but they were essentially saying to Paul, Paul, your life is full of sorrow. And he would say, yeah, but I'm always rejoicing. They say, but you are poor. And he says, yeah, but my poverty has made others rich. And they'd say, but you have nothing. And he'd say, and yet I possess everything. Again and again, Paul had two choices that were set before him. He could run away and cling to the mirage of safety cling to comfort and empty promises of fulfillment, or he could fulfill his true calling and risk it all for the cause of Christ. His definitive answer to this question comes in Acts 20, verse 24. I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may accomplish the, my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Now notice that this quote gives us the deeper reason why many are reluctant to risk for the cause of Christ today. If your life on this earth is your ultimate concern, the thing of supreme value to you, in other words, if it is your idol, then you will make only minimal sacrifices for Jesus. For you cannot afford to take real risks and squander your true treasure. But as the scriptures testify to us time and again, if you choose this route, if you choose the route of valuing your life more than anything else, then your life in the end will be characterized by nothing, nothing more than a vain pursuit of empty promises, of vanity, of vanities, because that's where the worship of idols always ends, in utter disappointment, in a wasted life. A life where you exhaust your efforts building greater silos and greater, greater and greater silos of security, only to die on the day of their completion. And don't think for a moment that such towers can't be built by those who confess to be Christians. The only difference with those people is they try to sanctify them by painting a cross on their silos. But this is why Jesus said, in order to gain your life, you must lose it. For it is only when losing your life is okay that you will have the freedom to really live it. If you cling to your life and your possessions, in a sense, really, you're already dead. Indeed, this is what the death and resurrection of Christ secures for us. It's freedom from the enslaving fear of losing our present life. It is the freedom to die to it all and then to fulfill our true purpose and to really live. Now, other than during times of war, American Christians have rarely been required to make the kinds of sacrifices that the Apostle Paul made in his day. We have rarely had to make the hard choice of risking our fortunes and lies for the cause of Christ. This was not true, of course, of the founders of our country, nor for the brave men who spearheaded the abolitionist movement and so many others that we could mention who faced immense sacrifices in conforming our society to the image of Christ. But for the most part, there has been relative peace for Christians. For we have been a country founded upon Christian ideals, a nation formed after thousands of years of moral and political progress through the application of Christian principle. 
But the days of general peace and comfort are swiftly coming to an end, it seems. For our culture is becoming increasingly hostile to its biblical roots, and the time of greater sacrifice is once again upon us. Evidence of which is the fact that we're having our services out on the courthouse lawn simply because we affirmed that gender is binary. If you don't think that we are living in extraordinary times, I think you are profoundly naive. Indeed, it's been the church's naivete, as well as its unwillingness to make smaller sacrifices in resistance that has brought us to this point. In the days ahead, the fulfilling of God's mandate is going to become not only more and more complicated, but more and more costly. And if we back down to those who persecute us now, by which I mean that if we fail to love them enough to tell them the truth, and we do that out of fear or out of a desire to preserve our own wealth or our own reputation or even our own life, then our witness will be ruined and our culture will be lost. And our grandchildren and our children even will live in a radically different world than the one we live in now. So tomorrow is Memorial Day, the day we remember all those who made the ultimate sacrifice for this country for the freedoms that we enjoy, all of the ways that we are able to flourish because they gave their lives for it. We must let Memorial Day tomorrow not be a day of shopping and other forms of frivolity, but instead let it be a somber reminder that we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who risk it all for the cause of God. Let us not throw away our confidence and its great reward, wasting our lives in fear. But let us play the man for the people of God and for the city of Georgetown. And may the Lord do what seems good to him. Because it's better to lose our life than to waste it. Now let me just end by saying to all of those who are hiding in their comfy church buildings, to exhort them to come out, to come out of the catacombs and join the resistance because it is right to risk for the cause of Christ.